Who do you think is the most vile in the lands between? Could it be the one who defiles, murders all, severing many journeys back to the Erd Tree? Could it be the brute who will destroy entire villages, do anything in order to obtain more knowledge? Could it be the blasphemer who ruthlessly tortured many, feeding himself to an ever-consuming greed? For me, the most vile is the one who not only performs these atrocious acts, but deep down, realises that they are wrong. So they disguise themselves behind a seemingly innocent mask. In service to Rani, the sorcerer Celebus acts high and mighty, having a mix of politeness and disdain for many like the Tarnished. This attitude is a small escape for their locked away dark secret. Celebus has hidden chambers, housing many individuals frozen in time. Celebus eagerly reveals them to be his puppets, forced to do his bidding, whatever that could be. But secrets spread like wildfire, and many become exposed to Celebus' dark passenger, with most becoming revolted. So it's no surprise that one time when the Tarnished visits Celebus' rides, he is found dead. However, even the lowest of the low deserve justice, with their last untold secrets of their own murderer revealed. But because of Celebus' notoriety, there are so many individuals with the motive to end Celebus. So who really killed Celebus? Join us in uncovering this murder mystery. Celebus' crime scene is different to other murders depicted throughout Elden Ring. Many display a scene of a struggle, painting a picture of the victim's last moment. But Celebus' rise is left relatively untouched, with Celebus slumped where he was once normally alive, with seemingly no sign of a struggle. What remains is Celebus' bell bearing, which confirms his death, along with the preceptor's set. An untouched crime scene shouldn't be slighted as a lack of evidence, but rather the displaying of a different story. There was no sign of a struggle, so perhaps the death was caused by a poisoning of sorts. A murder performed like this would have allowed the culprit to remain at a distance, which is why the rise could have been left so undisturbed. Celebus is also shaped eerily similar to his puppets. Perhaps either as a sign of revenge, or a hint that Celebus could be a puppet himself. So it's definitely quite possible that a potion of some sort was used on Celebus. In the real world, poisonings are most likely to occur by medical professionals than any other profession. This is most likely due to both their knowledge and access to drugs and potential poisons. In a similar vein, Celebus's murderer could also be someone knowledgeable in the potion field, similar to Celebus. One similar sorcerer in the lands between is Selen. A sorcerer expelled from the Academy of Rhea Lucaria, Selen can be found exiled in the Waypoint Ruins. Throughout her quests, there are hints that she has some sort of connection with Celebus. The note to the Preceptor's secret hints at the puppets that Preceptor Celebus was holding in the cellar, not too far from the Sisters Three. And a vile graven witch seems to be a frequent visitor to that place. Selen's nemesis, Witch Hunter Jeren, describes her to be quite similar to that frequent visitor. Selen, Graven Witch, enemy of Caria. I vow this time to crush both your frame and your primal glintstone. But what's strange is that in Selen's cellar, we can see a puppet that looks oddly similar to Selen. The Tarnish can later use his body as a vessel to transplant Selen's primal glintstone into. But it begs to question why this puppet was brought into existence to begin with. Obligatory Account 47 believes that Celebus used his puppet to exile Selen from the Academy. A student of the Academy of Rhea Lucaria, Thops, details his knowledge about his ex-fellow school member. Selen was well known. The most promising sorceress in the history of the Academy. 
I followed her at school. But there may as well have been an ocean between us. But Selen was expelled from the academy, accused of unthinkable treatment of certain sorcerers, under the name of the Graven Witch. I still don't believe the accusations. The illustrious Selen would never do such things. Whatever Selen was accused of, Thops cannot believe that Selen herself could do these acts. So maybe this was the act of an impersonator, fooling many, especially witch hunter Jaren. This would be a huge motive for the death of Selivus, equaling the ruined life of one to the death of another. However, I'm not sure if this impersonation is that likely. Selivus alludes that he has helped Selen in the past. She owes me for the help I gave her when she was expelled from the academy. I asked her to look into the matter some time ago. So perhaps this puppet was just a remnant of his help. Perhaps her glint stone already needed to be transferred during her expulsion. When we offer this letter of introduction to Selen, she remarks, Well, well, Selivus is not a name I ever wanted to hear again. It's an interesting juxtaposition. Not wanting to hear about Selivus does contradict the evidence of the secret visits to Selivus' chamber. But it seems there isn't an aggressive dislike between Selen and Selivus. At least not as compelling enough to murder. And more conclusively, Selen does detail the reasoning for why she was exiled from the Academy of Rhea Lucaria. If you recall, I was exiled from the Academy of Rhea Lucaria. It was for attempting to restore the primeval current of Glinstone sorcery. The toothless pedantry peddled by the Carian royal family can rot for all I care. I want glinstone sorceries that open our minds, unbound by terrestrial taboos, no matter what we give in return. The primeval current is a forbidden tradition of glinstone sorcery. To those who cleave to its teaching, the act of collecting sorcerers to fashion them into seeds of stars is but another part of scientific inquiry. It seems that the primeval current is a place of early knowledge, which many minds are not steeled enough to handle. Selen was not the only one who was expelled for her association with the Primeval Current. Primeval Sorcerer Azul and Master Lusat were once Grandmasters at the Academy of Rhea Lucaria, but were now also exiled. When Azul glimpsed into the Primeval Current, he saw darkness. He was left both bewitched and fearful of the Abyss. And when Lusat glimpsed into the Primeval Current, he beheld the final moments of a great star cluster, and upon seeing it, he too was broken. Perhaps Selen was not also prepared to glimpse into the primeval current, which could be why she turned into a graven mass, a nightmare that would continue to haunt the academy. But this does mean that Thops was more likely mistaken as to how sinister Selen could be, which means her motive to murder Selivus is much weaker. But perhaps there are more clues in Selivus' story. Throughout the tarnished interaction with Selivus, he sends them on errands to create new puppets, by administering them with potions. The first victim we are an accomplice for is Nefeli Lu, a warrior and adoptive daughter of Gideon. Upon purchasing two puppets and all of Selivus' sorceries, he reveals another, more masterful plan. Perhaps you'll be interested in a little scheme of mine. It will produce the finest of puppets, which I aspire to cherish with these very hands. A ploy to fool even Lady Rani. The dead-eyed doll lets down her guard in your presence rather remarkably, though she might dip her hands in the dirt and feign that icy persona. She's a frail, gentle girl at heart. Selivus plans to betray Rani and turn her into one of his puppets, a gleaming trophy to adorn his sick collection. Some, such as no one from Atharka and Matthias Lucanen 7718, believe that Rani killed Selivus. Selivus betrays Rani, and there's the possibility that Rani got wind of this and decided to end Selivus as punishment for his betrayal. Selivus could be hinting at his dislike for Rani when the Tarnish first meets with him. I don't know what it is the mistress sees in a provincial tarnished like you. But since we have the misfortune of serving the same lady... From a face value, it seems that Selivus is degrading the tarnished, not wanting to be serving the same individual, that perhaps it's also murmuring the misfortune of serving Rani entirely. 
If Rani has given Celebus a concoction, the Amber Draft, Celebus is mysteriously found dead shortly after, slumped in his chair. If this quest is not followed, but Rani's quest is, then Celebus also dies once Rani has been given the Finger Slayer Blade. This blood drenched fetish is a proof of the high treason committed by the Eternal City and symbolises its downfall. Perhaps Rani also used his blade to kill Celebus as symbolism for his treason. But surely murder by blade would have left some more evidence. Matthias Lucanen 7718 believes that the coincidence between the death of Blythe, E.G., and Celebus, all happening around the same time and all being in service to Rani, is too coincidental. Rani could have just seen them all as loose ends that needed to be cleaned up. Blythe and E.G. both. Kind of heart. Art willing to give too much to me. Yet, they both understand what lieth beyond the dark path, that I must betray everything and rid the world of what came before. Perhaps Celibus, not so kind of heart, was also aware that what lies beyond the dark path is death, so attempted to create a potion in order to circumvent his death. In a similar vein, if the very same murderer was killing all of Rani's followers, then it could be possible that the Black Knife assassins assassinated Celibus. Black Knight Assassin corpses can be found around the body of E.G. and Blythe, and during our examination of E.G.'s murder, it does seem likely that E.G. could have been murdered by the Black Knight Assassins. But the lack of Black Knight Assassins around Celibus does indicate that perhaps Celibus was not slain by them. But one of those that they attacked, Blythe, may provide another clue to this murder. Half man and half wolf, Blythe is the guardian of Rani. But in a cruel twist, it seems that Blythe is meant to be a guardian to the Two Fingers, attempting to keep Rani in line. But if Lady Rani, as an Empyrean, resists being an instrument of the Two Fingers, the Shadow will go mad, transforming from a follower into a horrid curse. Rani does in fact resist being an instrument to the Two Fingers, but this doesn't result in Blythe murdering Rani. He instead becomes mad fighting an inner battle of his created destiny, clashing with his strong values of loyalty. No, I'm part of her very being. I can never betray her, Rani. She needs me. This loyalty is drawn hand in hand with Blythe's hatred for traitors. After defeating Radan at Mistwood Ruins, before the Tarnished enters Nokron, Blythe leaves a message. There's a traitor taken care of. Onwards to knock from then. Go on, I'll catch up. Nameless things oppose that this traitor is in fact Celibus. Theorising the Blight figured out that Celibus wanted to make Rani his puppets, and then deals with the traitorous vermin. BP Platinum Paladin expands on how Blight could have become knowledgeable of Celibus' unsavoury habits. At the Redan Festival, many individuals appear in the Red Man Castle Courtyard including one that looks like Finger Maiden Therolina, one of Celibus' puppets. Perhaps Blythe noticed that Celibus was up to something at the Radan Festival, and uncovered the plot to betray Rani. But the text of Blythe dealing with the traitor doesn't exactly line up with the timeline of Celibus' death. When the Tarnish reads this message, if they visit Celibus, he is still in fact alive. Black Rain 39 supposes that the message is more likely a message to Darawil, Upon our introduction to Blythe at the Mistwood Ruins, he does state, Darrowell is nothing but a traitor, and in need of a fitting end to his tale. Bloodhound Knight Darrowell can be found at the Forlorn Hound Everjail, with Blythe being able to be summoned to help fight this Bloodhound. The Bloodhound Knight set states that each Bloodhound Knight chooses his own master. Once the decision has been made, the Knights stay loyal for life. Perhaps the reason that Darrowell was locked up was due to his traitorous acts, betraying the one that he was meant to be loyal for life. This could have angered the loyal Blight, aligning with the same motives of hating those that broke their loyalties. But no matter who the culprit is so far, there still feels like there's one large part of the crime scene, one crucial piece of the jigsaw, that we haven't yet pieced together. Why was Celibus' rise so undisturbed, as if there was no resistance to his death? or even a presence of a murderer. Curiously, 
If Celibus dies, we can still access his shop to purchase puppets. And if we do so, we can see that the name of the traitor has changed from Celibus to Puppet. So maybe Celibus has actually been turned into a puppet. An ironic end to his existence. But how could this have happened? Draft Marrow 50 speculates that Gideon could have brought about the demise of Celibus. One of Celibus' potential victims is Nefeli, Gideon's daughter. Before the Tarnish gives the potion to Nefeli, they can talk to Gideon. Are you really going to do the bidding of that twisted dolly botherer? Or would you rather hand that potion to me and see if we can't get one over on the bastard? Gideon alludes that he has history with Celibus, with Gideon not seeing eye to eye. Dolores the Sleeping Arrow Puppet states that Dolores once belonged to the Round Table Hold, where she was both a critic and a friend of Gideon the All-Knowing. It was because of her that he and Celibus went their separate ways, so it seems that Gideon was once friends with Celibus, perhaps sharing their dirty secrets of puppets, until Celibus' exploiting of a close friend Dolores was performed. Maybe the puppeteering of Nefeli was a step too far for Gideon, and he himself puppeted Celibus, getting one over Celibus, giving him a taste of his own medicine. It could be possible, but Gideon does state, Oh, I won't interfere. You go ahead and do what you must. The round table has no code to speak of. So it seems that if the Tarnished follows the path of Celibus, Gideon himself won't prevent the Tarnished or Celibus from their plans. However, it's not just Gideon and Celibus who have had their affiliations with puppets. A lowly Karian servant in the Karia Manor, Pedia can be seen dying at the same time Celibus is slumped. You're my puppet. I loved you with all I have. How could you forget such bliss? It seems a bit more than a coincidence that two puppeteers are dying at the same time. So who really is Pedia? Sven the Horrible supposes that Pedia is actually Celibus' puppet master. Pedia's puppets turn against him upon the slumpening of Celibus, and upon his death, Pedia either drops Nefeli's puppets or Dolores' puppets. Both of these puppets were created by Celibus, so it's strange that they end up being in the possession of Pitya. Like Celibus, Pitya loves his puppets, and airs the same creepy vibes. If Celibus was in fact the puppet of Pitya, then he would be just some sort of persona of Pitya, perhaps playing the character of a noble sorcerer, one who could obtain more information than Pitya himself. Like Neverice suggests, Pedia creates the persona of Celibus in order to obtain the Academy's knowledge. To support this theory, there's a notion floating around that Pedia has the same voice actor as Celibus, Charles Dale. However, Pedia doesn't have their voice actor credited clearly, so it's hard to confirm who the voice actor really is. He could be credited under Ancient Albinorix, which are voiced by Jimmy Livingstone and Kevin Howell. If they do have the same voice actor, it would strengthen the links between Pitya and Celibus. But because we can't confirm it, we should leave it to the side for now. Pitya managed to fool many, misdirecting all blame to one of his puppets. Apart from one, one who managed to turn his very own puppets against him. This could be a figure such as Rani, a demigod who knew how to squash a puppet regime once it threatened to become bigger than herself. Or less likely, someone such as Gideon, the one of knowledge, who knew the deeper secrets of Celibus, turning against him once his close friend Dolores was taken under control by Pitya. Although it's a bit strange that someone of such lowly stature, Pitya, would be such a powerful figure. Or could it just be echoes of an Elden Ring type 30 pygmy? Pitya does state that, I am charged with maintaining these ghastly dolls. So like Switch Frosty suggests, Pedia is just a caretaker, one looking after Celibus' puppets. But that explanation doesn't entirely add up either. Celibus was very curt to the Tarnished. I don't know what it is the mistress sees in a provincial Tarnished like you. So why would he share his darkest secret with such a lowly Albinoric? Maybe this is to ensure his dark secret is kept hidden, obscured by a xenophobic facade. Switch Frosty further explains that the puppets don't go rogue until the one controlling them dies, 
When Celibus is dead, these puppets can now turn on their sick and caretaker, Pidia. Having sorted through all the suspects, I feel that we are equipped as we can be to accuse the murderer of Celibus, or so-called killer. The lack of a struggle, seen in the usual victims of the Black Knife assassins, suggests that Celibus' demise wasn't that of an assassination by the Black Knives, but more so a cunning thought of puppeteering, as evidenced by Celibus' posture, and his name when accessing his merchant screen post-life. Celibus' bell bearing does suggest that Celibus has indeed died, or at least somewhat died, stating that it was found upon his parish flesh. While Selen was associated with Celibus, I believe that she did indeed begrudgingly owe Celibus a favour, and wouldn't stoop as low as murdering Celibus, rather just being consumed by her pursuit to glimpse into the primeval current. Blythe, although adamant on loyalty, I don't think would become aware of the extent of Celibus' deception, and didn't murder Celibus either. Pidia is definitely heavily linked with Celibus, either with Celibus using the services of a detestable Albanoric, or was the lowest of the low, hoodwinking the entire lands between. While both are unlikely, I believe Celibus would have used Pidia as an accomplice for all of his devious acts, with Pidia taking care of the beloved puppets. Both Gideon and Rani are devious individuals, and both have the ability to turn Celibus into a puppet. But I believe Gideon was primarily focused on his own pursuit, with him not even really caring for his own daughter that could be enslaved by Celibus. But I would like to accuse the true puppeteering murderer behind Celibus' demise, Rani. Rani was directly threatened by Celibus, and was well aware of his deception. I believe that she could have tricked Celibus into drinking a potion that puppeted himself, causing many of his puppets to become free, maddened, or both, and killed his hidden ally that was Pidia. While this is all in good as an accusation, I'm not too sure if Rani would be convicted by the jury. If puppets were to become free, or to attack Pidia when Celibus dies, why are all the puppets in Celibus' basement still immobile? And why does E.G the Karian War Counselor also die in a similar position to the puppets. We may have yet to find a watertight solution for this death, and maybe the future continent of Elden Ring will provide further evidence to solve this murder. Or could it increase the calls for us lands between detectives? We better keep our notebooks ready and our eyes peeled, anticipating for when we are called to the crime scene once again.